Greetings and peace to each of you. It's good that you are here on this Good Friday service. We commemorate the death of Jesus. That Jesus went to the cross for each of us. Jesus sacrificed his body, mind, and soul, all of who he was, so that we might live spiritually, that we might know forgiveness and peace and freedom in this life and in the next. And so this is our commemoration of the Good Friday service of the death and passion and death of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's good that you're here. Service is in the bulletin and the, the hymns are in the common praise and we worship and gather together uh, and know that the spirit of the crucified Christ is with us and that that spirit, his spirit, gives us comfort and compassion in the midst of our humanness, in the midst of our weakness, in the midst of our grief and our suffering. Christ's spirit is with us here today and always. This is the day that Christ, the Lamb of God, gave himself into the hands of those who would slay him. This is the day, sorry. <clears throat> sorry. I apologize, I was using, I have all my services in one binder, so I must apologize. <laughs> Let's try it again and begin again. Like, like they say in school, we'll have a do-over. <laughs> oh, we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has on him the of us all. Christ the Lord became obedient unto death. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We pray you of your mercy, forgive us all this past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life. To the glory of your name. Amen. May the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, look graciously, pray, we pray on this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.
seated. A reading from the book of Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be high. Just as there were many who astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals, so he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them, they shall see. And that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we've heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance, in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we account him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole. And by his bruises we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We've all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep, that before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich. Although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one my servant shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. The refrain for our psalm is, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? All who see me deride me. They curl their lips. They toss their heads. He trusted in the Lord. Let him save him and release him if he is his friend. Many dogs have surrounded me. A band of the wicked beset me. They tear holes in my hands and feet. I can count every one of my bones. They divide my clothing among them. They cast lots for my robe. O oh Lord, do not leave me alone. My strength, make haste to help me. I will tell of your name to my people and praise you where they are assembled. 
You who fear the Lord, give praise. All children of Jacob, give glory. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A reading from the book of Hebrews. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who has promised is faithful, and let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. For the reading of the Passion of our Lord, you're invited to stay seated since it's a, a long reading. And at the, I believe it's the last three or four paragraphs when Jesus is in Golgotha, taken to Golgotha. And at that time, I'll invite you to stand in honor of hearing the Passion story of the Gospel. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Jesus, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, And they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. And then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked him, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. And when Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth, and Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest, that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside the gate, at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. 
Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them, warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. And Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I've said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. And when he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face saying, is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, if I've spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man who was ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? And again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters, and it was early in the morning, and they themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement, defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and asked, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, if this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, take yourselves and judge him according to your own law. The Jews replied, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then, Peter, Pete, sorry. then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you ask this on your own or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests has handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? After he said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? And they shouted in reply, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit, and Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it in on his head, they dressed him in a purple robe, and they kept coming up to him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate again went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. And when the chief priests and the police saw them, saw him, they shouted, shouted, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. And the Jews answered him, we have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has claimed to be the son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, where are you from? Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, 
If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at the place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Kabasa. Now, it was the day of preparation for the Passover. It was about noon. He said to the Jews, here is your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked, shall I crucify your king? And the G chief priest answered, we have no king but the emperor. And he handed him over to be crucified. Standing if you're able. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out what is called the, to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with two others, one on either side with Jesus between them, Pilate also had an inscription written and put it on, put it on his cro other cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews. But this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four pieces, four parts, one for each soldier. They took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture said. They divided my clothes among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her. He said to his mother, woman, here is your son. And then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own, took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all now was finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of wine on the branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. And when Jesus had received no wine, he said, the wine, he said, it is finished. And then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Lord, take our mind, Lord, take our minds and think through them. Take my lips and speak through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you. What we know not teach us, what we have not give us, and what we are not make us. This we ask in your holy and righteous name, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Please be seated. It's uh, really good to have all of you here. We, we, we try to um, go back to, every year, these services of the Tridium, the Holy Week, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and an Easter vigil and try to figure out how many we had last year and then we, so this is this is a good night it's a, not that we're all about numbers but, but more about persons and people and so each of you are special to the parish and to me and so I'm glad you're here the cross is a it was a common symbol in the day of Jesus, but not the symbol of Christianity as it is today. I have several, I have about four or five silver crosses and on silver chains. 
and, and I wear them, um, but I didn't wear them during Holy Week. I wear them as my uh, can as a canon. You can wear your cross, and, and we studied that. We talked about that in one of our studies, but but I didn't wear them because the cross for this week is not a place that you hold in a, a good way. It was a place of shame. And as I've journeyed through this week, and it is a journey, well, as a priest of a parish, um, you go each day, and I know it's only maybe in the first several days, it might be only a half an hour service, and I'll be only, but it, you know, but it's a, if you if you try to stay to the devotion of the week and do some praying and reflection, maybe Bible reading, as well as doing your work and connecting with people and the things, the duties and having that as part of your devotion as well. <clears throat> If you go through this week, it is a very emotional week. Not just for a priest. I know I've talked to some of you, and you have shared that as well, that this week is an emotional week. Because it is our Lord who was alive and lived, and he died for us. And it's like Good Friday sometimes is like a funeral service, but, but, but not. Because we're not talking about his funeral, but we're talking about his demise, his complete, utter destruction and removal from the earth. And in that, there are, there's the cross, and the cross is empty. This is a beautiful cross um, because it's so big and it gives you the visual. And, but in, there's some things in the cross that we find this day that bring healing to the human race. There are three issues in human life, because I, we always talk about why did Jesus die? And of course, the simple answer, the Christian answer, he died for our sins. But as I reflected on this week, there are some deeper issues for which our Lord died, which address humanity. One of those is the issue of abandonment. Jesus was abandoned on the cross. As he died before he died, minutes before he died, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This was a man who stilled a storm in the middle of Lake Galilee. This was a man who walked on water several kilometers to his disciples. This was a man who fed 5,000 and 7,000 at two different times. He could not do this work unless God was with him, in him, at all times. And he knew that he had to be abandoned. And there was a reason for that and the reason was that he had to go into a place where God was not. Tradition or even the scripture talks about Jesus descending to the dead or to hell. And there he preaches to them so that those people can come from the place of the dead to the place of heaven, to the place of God. And so in order for God to really enter and into our abandonment, he abandoned Jesus. And in that moment, said, no one ever will be abandoned again. No human soul needs to feel abandoned. We all have issues which stem from some kind of abandonment. Even if we've raised, been raised in decent homes and, and good homes and parents that were always there. And I know my mother and father were there. And they, they were always there. They helped me in my education. They helped me in, in my weirdness as a kid and growing up and being different. They supported me. They never said, oh, you're so odd. But they always just supported who I was and my choices. Yet 
there are other issues of abandonment, and I and, and you know as we grow, I I think back to the, the the very formative years of being eight and nine, and some of my friends that I was developing these very good friendships, and either they moved, or later on we moved, and never saw those friendships again, and I had to think that why sometimes am I a little untrusting of people? Well, it goes back to this issue, I felt abandoned. Whether they were not abandoned me or not, that's how I felt. And then I had to work on that. And say, God never abandons me, and I don't need to feel that. And I know that I can trust people and develop good and healthy relationships. And so it has taken, with the power of the Holy Spirit, time and effort to get through that. But the issue of humanity which Jesus addresses through the cross is our abandonment. Because God says to us, you will never ever need to feel abandoned. I am with you, always. In a world where people are lonely, in a world where people are abandoned, in a world where people are displaced, in a world where people are thrown out like garbage, we need to know God does not abandon us, God does not abandon them, and to take that message from the cross to them. The second issue that Jesus deals with, the second human life issue is the sense of worthiness. We all have insecurities. I read a book, I read lots of books, a long time ago when I was a teenager, and I read this book and it said, don't worry about your insecurities because everybody's insecure. And, and, and I, I never believed that book because I thought that everybody else was more secure than I could ever be. But I realize now that as I got older, that we all have our insecurities. And they may stem from a, a, a place of feeling, I'm not worthy of you, God. And I do believe that a lot of people in the world do not come to church because there's a sense, maybe a fear of God, but a sense that they don't belong, a sense that they feel unworthy. If anyone feels unworthy, they can look to this cross and see that the Savior of the world hung there and died in excruciating pain because each of us is worthy before God. Each of us has a plan and purpose in our life. Each of us makes a difference in the world. And so our worthiness comes from the fact that Jesus died for us, for our lives, to say, you are special, you are worthy, and you count and you matter. And in a world where many people feel, and I would say generations, particularly the younger generations, that feel 30 plus and lower, plus others. But when they feel like they don't matter, no count. They feel like nobody cares, nobody's with them. They really have nothing to live for. We must look to the teaching of this day of the cross. It says, you are worthy because God died there for you. And to take that message to those people, and say, you are worthy, you have value, you have merit, stand with me. The third uh, um, issue that Jesus addresses in the teaching of the cross is that of the need to control and manipulate. We all have a need to control. Manipulate might sound a little negative and it's not meant to be, 
But we all have a need to control. We all need some kind of control, self-autonomy. There's that's one of the basic needs we all need growing up. But there is a need to, and I, I must confess, I have that need. I'm a little bit OCD, and so that's where it comes. I need to make sure my papers on my desk, don't touch them. You can get them, I can give them to you, but they have to be just so, and I know I drive my family nuts at home sometimes, and I think, what is that need about, the need to control? And it, because somehow it brings comfort to me. And so the need, whatever, however you seek to control, we all have it, and we all do it. That's my way. You might do it in a different way. But we all do it, and, and whether it's good or it's not good or bad, it just is the way we are as humans. But what the cross teaches us is that we can give up control. We don't have to worry as much. We don't have to be bound by our own implications of whether we think we're good or bad. Jesus gave up his life on the cross. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. He gave up. Because he knew ultimately God was in control. God is in control of your life, in this life and in the next. When I die, I don't worry. I know that I will, my soul will leave here and go to heaven. I have no doubt, I have no doubt that I will see the face of Jesus and be welcomed into his kingdom. So if I believe that so strongly, then maybe along the way, because of the cross, I can follow the example of Jesus and give up some control and enjoy my life and release and walk with others in peace. This is Good Friday. This is a day we remember the teachings of the cross, what they bring to us. God frees us from abandonment. God assures us that we are worthy. And God allows us to let go of control so that we can trust God and know that all will be well. I'm going to end with a song. The rock of the cross for me is a rock that I cling to in my life and one day in my death. The cross for me is a rock. On its teachings, I cling to in this life for the next. The cross is a rock which I, in my teachings and ministry, offer to you regularly so that you too cling to the cross in this life and for the next. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flow be of sin the double cure. Cleanse me from its guilt and power. Not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my seal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save, and thou alone. Nothing in my hand I bring, Simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, 
Helpless look to thee for grace, fell I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, I die, while I draw this fleeting breath. When my eyelids close in death, when I saw through tracks unknown, see thee on thy judgment throne, rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Let us pray. Brothers and sisters, for the Holy Church throughout the world, <clears throat> Almighty and eternal God, you have shown your glory to all the nations in Jesus Christ. By your Holy Spirit, guide the Church and gather it throughout the world. Help in Help to persevere in faith, proclaim your name, and bring the good news of salvation in Christ to all people. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Let us pray for Todd, our bishop, for Mark, our pastor, for Carol, our priest assistant, and all servants of the church, and for all the people of God. Almighty and eternal God, your spirit guides the church and makes it holy. Strengthen up and uphold our bishops, pastors, other ministers and lay leaders. Keep them in health and safety for the good of the church and help each of us in our various vocations to do faithfully the work to which you have called us. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Let us pray for those preparing for baptism. Almighty and eternal God, you continue to bless the church, increase the faith and understanding of those preparing for baptism. Give them new birth as your children and keep them in the faith and communion of your holy church. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Let us pray for our sisters and brothers who share our faith in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> Almighty and eternal God, you give your church unity. Look with favor on all who follow Jesus, your son. Make all the baptized one in the fullness of faith and keep us united in the fellowship of love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for the Jewish people, the first to hear the word of God. Almighty and eternal God, long ago you gave the promise to Abraham and your teaching to Moses. Hear our prayers that the people you called and elected as your own may receive the fulfillment of covenant provinces. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who do not share our faith in Jesus Christ. Almighty and eternal God, gather into your embrace all those who call out to you under different names. Bring an end to interreligious strife 
and make us more faithful witnesses of the love made known to us in your Son. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who do not believe in God. Almighty and eternal God, you created humanity so that all may know, long to know you and find peace in you. Grant that all may recognize the signs of your love and grace in the world and in the lives of Christians and gladly acknowledge you as the one true God. We ask it through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for God's creation. Almighty and eternal God, you are the creator of a magnificent universe. Hold all the worlds in the arms of your care and bring all things to fulfillment in you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who serve in public office. Almighty and eternal God, you are the champion of the poor and oppressed. In your goodness, give wisdom to those in authority so that all people may enjoy justice, peace, freedom, and a share in the goodness of your creation. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Let us pray for those in need. Almighty and eternal God, you give strength to the weary and new courage to those who have lost heart. Heal the sick, comfort the dying, give safety to travelers. Free those unjustly deprived of liberty and deliver your world from falsehood, hunger, and disease. Hear the prayers of all who call on you in any trouble, that they may have the joy of receiving your help in their need. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now this portion of our service as we have uh, meditation on the cross. We look to the cross, we think of the cross, we remember the healings that the cross brings, that God through the cross brings to our human life. And so this is our meditation. This is the wood of the cross in which hung the Savior of the world. Come, let us.
Is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? Look and see if there's any sorrow like my sorrow, which was brought upon me, which the Lord inflicted on the day of his fierce anger. O oh, my people, O oh, my church, what have I done to you? Or in what have I offended you? Testify against me. I led you forth from the land of Egypt and delivered you by the waters of baptism. But you have prepared a cross for your Savior. I led you through the desert 40 years and fed you with manna. I brought you through tribulation and penitence and gave you my body, the bread of heaven. But you have prepared a cross for your Savior. What could I have done for you that I have not done? I planted you, my chosen and fairest vineyard. I made you the branches of my vine. But when I was thirsty, you gave me vinegar to drink and pierced with a spear the side of your Savior. I went before you in a pillar of cloud and you led me to the judgment hall of Pilate. I scourged your enemies and brought you to the land of freedom, but you have scourged, mocked, and beaten me. I gave you the water of salvation from the rock, but you have given me gall and left me to thirst. I gave you a royal scepter and bestowed the kings to the kingdom, but you have given me a crown of thorns. I raised you in high with great power, but you have hanged me on the cross. My peace I gave, which the world cannot give, and washed your feet as a sign of my love, but you draw the sword to strike in my name and seek high places in my kingdom. I offered you my body and blood, but you scatter and deny and abandon me. I sent the spirit of truth to guide you and you close your hearts to the counselor. I pray that all may be as one in the Father and me, but you continue to quarrel and divide. I call you to go and bring forth fruit, but you cast lots for my clothing. I grafted you into the tree of my chosen Israel, and you turned on them with persecution and mass murder. I made you joint heirs with them of my covenants, but you made them scapegoats for your own guilt. I came to you as the least of your brothers and sisters. I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me, naked, and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us.
our thoughts, the meditations of our hearts, our thoughts of this day, words and the beautiful music that have sounded in our souls. We gather all of these into one prayer on this Good Friday, remembering the love of the cross that was poured out for us, receiving that love through this prayer. And we gather all of our thoughts, all of our prayers into one prayer, whatever your prayer is on this Good Friday, whatever is on your heart or on your mind. We gather all of these into one prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught his friends to pray, the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Just uh, before the closing prayer, um, two things. Uh, as I've talked on Sunday, Palm Sunday, about the passion of Christ, and that a lot of that, what he experienced, different from our, our own stories, but in a way, same to our own human passions and things that we experience. And that Good Friday is an opportunity to, to bring those passions uh, good or bad, anything that you struggle with, and to nail it to the cross symbolically. And so um, after the service will end after this prayer, and you're invited to come and go uh, to leave in quiet, I will be at the door. If you want to be quiet and not to me to talk to you, just go out. If you, But I'd like to be there to um, greet you if you want to be greeted by me. So I'll, I'll, be, I'll be out there. And, um, but also, we're inviting you, if you want to come and have a moment at the cross, uh, just you and the cross and God, we invite you to do that as well. And, and if you need some prayers, Norma is going to be in the, the St. Thomas Chapel. If you need some prayers of encouragement and peace on this day, please go and see Norma. So that's, so that's the uh, kind of ending of our Good Friday service, and I'm so glad you're all here. Thank you to our, our choir, and of course, Katie, and to Norma, who's been a great help as lay reader for the last couple of days, and, and David Adair as well. <laughs> okay. And now the closing prayer. 
Send down your abundant blessing, Lord, upon your people who have devoutly recalled the death of your son in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection. Grant them pardon, bring them comfort. May their faith grow stronger and stronger and their eternal salvation be assured. We ask this through Christ our Lord.